Sure, man. Go right ahead. Amen. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you, choir. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Jamie. Jamie, I was talking with Bob Gates earlier today, and you're kind of like Ringo Starr. <laughs> I didn't realize, I've been listening to the Beatles chant a lot on, on Sirius XM this yeah. week, and I really didn't realize just what an incredible drummer that Ringo is. And so went back and read some articles about him. And, and Bob and I figured, you are so great, we don't realize how great you are, because you just make it happen. So now, who, who, who's John, Paul, and George? I don't know, but... But we know we got, we got Ringo. If you follow along the Revised Common Lectionary, as we do here at Wells, um, the last few weeks in the Gospel of John, Jesus has been inundating us with these bread of life metaphors and these things that he's talking about. And today we have the last one in this line of, of, uh, of readings and the penultimate line in the text states what Jesus has hinted at all along, that the bread of life and words of eternal life are one and the same. And it's almost a reference back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, when as God said to the Israelites, God has humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, Deuteronomy 8.3. So with that, if you're able to stand, I would invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. So Jesus begins very cannibalistic here. He said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me lives because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It isn't like the bread your ancestors ate and then they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Many of the disciples who heard this said, This message is harsh. Who can hear it? Jesus knew that the disciples were grumbling about this, and he said to him, Does this offend you? What if you were to see the human one going up where he, has, he was before? The spirit is the one who gives life, and the flesh doesn't help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Yet some of you don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who wouldn't believe and the one who would betray him. He said, for this reason, I said to you that none can come to me unless the Father enables them, or unless the Father calls them to me. And at this, many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied him. Jesus asked the twelve, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are God's holy one. The gospel of our Lord for the people of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Admit it. If you've ever been that one that you go to a party and then gets to admit, this is really hard stuff. And when somebody asks, do you wish to go away, you secretly say, yes, I do. In fact, if I'm totally honest, these bread passages are really hard for me to grasp. 
I'm in a dialogue group with other pastors from around the metro area. And we meet on the last Thursday of each month. And this past Thursday we met. And, and I enjoy meeting because we get to talk about the various scripture passages that we're going to preach from, from that coming, for that coming Sunday. And this past week I was talking with Father Bob Blanton, who's the priest at Episcopal Church of the Creator in Clinton. Bob's a cool dude. I mean, if you just saw him, you would think he is the epitome of hippiness, right? <laughs> really cool. And so I asked him, I said, man, are you preaching from the gospel passage, son? He said, he said, yeah, it's a hard passage. I said, I know, right? He said, we're just really supposed to chew on Jesus all day long. And when he said that, I thought back when I was a little kid, my grandparents, my mom's parents lived right outside of Laurel and so-so right by Big Creek, which was not really close to anything. <laughs> and my grandfather had a bunch of cows. And so we'd hop in his truck and he'd go check on his cows. And I remember as a little kid, the funniest thing I ever saw was, you know, you'd see cows and they'd all be standing up, you know, and I, you, you kind of think the far side article, right? Where they're all standing up talking and all of a sudden, car! And they all go back down to, to grazing. but. They, were, they weren't, you know, didn't have their head down in the ground eating grass or anything. They were just sitting there going. I said, Papa, what, what are they doing? Are they chewing tobacco? Because my grandfather chewed tobacco like that. He said, no, son, they don't chew tobacco. They're chewing their cud. I said, what is cud? He said, Vomit. I said, vomit? He said, well, cows eat, and they have, they have weird stomachs. And so they get all this stuff in them, and then they throw it back up, and they chew on it. And I had a great steak last night. <laughs> right? But when you look at this passage of Scripture, Jesus is saying, you need to feast on me, to chew on me. Chew on my words. Let it be continually. So I began to read this passage again over the last few days. And the thing that, that really gets me in here is betrayal. John brings it up. There's no handing Jesus over to his enemies, right? Jesus hands himself over at his arrest, John chapter 10, verse 17, because that's what the good shepherd does. But what betrayal is here as you look at these disciples that walked away. Betrayal in John is not believing that the abundant life Jesus offers you is real. That's when you're saying, I don't believe you. I can't, I can't have any part of this. Betrayal is anything and everything that makes you think you aren't someone that Jesus could love. Yeah, we know God loves the world, right? He's got the whole world in his hands. But when it comes to you, do you really believe it? There are certain demands and stipulations, and we're all a special case, and we're all really worthy of that love. And if we're really honest, it seems really indiscriminate, doesn't it? That Jesus says, I love you all. No holes barred, nothing attached. I love you. God loves the world? Come on, man. What about, well, you know, the person you're thinking of right now. You know, maybe not. It seems a bit much, doesn't it? Betrayal is thinking that real relationship with Jesus is just a farce, just a figment of your hopeful imagination. Real relationship, think about it. I had a preacher tell me one time not too long ago, I couldn't believe the words came out of his mouth. He said, man, when, you, when you're in a church, don't be friends with, the, with your congregation. I said, what? How, how in the world can you be a pastor, be a minister, and not be friends with people in the congregation? 
We just don't want to get too connected to them. I, th I thought that was the whole point. Right? So betrayal is thinking that intimacy and want and desire and mutuality, nurture, safety. Betrayal says that stuff can't happen. That's for books and movies and TV shows. And we know God ma manipulates us anyway, right? Maybe that's the kind of God that the world wants us to believe in. But Jesus is saying here, you really want to know who I am. And the truth is, at the end of the day, life, real life, life lived, abundant life is hard to fathom. It's hard to accept, and it's hard to imagine sometimes that it can be ours. Betrayal is fundamentally a rejection of relationship, but it's also an unwillingness to receive life beyond measure. It's an inability to accept that abundant life could be true. A reluctance to envision, to dream, to picture that when God said God loves you, God meant I love you. When you start to doubt that you exist, God believes in you. When someone gives you a Judas kiss, God believes in you. When you're confounded by the evidence, God believes in you. So once again, betrayal here in this passage is about not being able to enter into relationship. These disciples had decided long before, hey, this is what it means to be the Messiah, and this is what you've got to do, and this is what you've got to say, and here's how you've got to act. And anything beyond that part doesn't fit our paradigm for you. And he asked, is this so hard to believe? Do you want to walk away? And they walk. And there's a reason Judas is introduced here for the first time. It's not by name. It, John says, like he does a lot of times, the one who was to betray Jesus stayed. The other disciples walk away. It's a betrayal not handing Jesus over, but not being able to handle the intimacy of a relationship with God. But most important, Peter tells the truth here. He doesn't stick his foot in his mouth this time. What does he say? Where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One of God. Chew on that for a minute. So you get to the end of these bread of life passages. But it's much more than bread. As it turns out, it's much more life than we could ever have imagined either. It's worth to abide in the word. Because as Jesus says in John chapter 8, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Have you ever changed something that you were comfortable doing to, to do a new way of doing that something? Have you? If so, there was probably a time when you wish you could just keep it the same old way, right? Why change? Change is hard. However, there are also those times in your life when you feel like you need something new, right? Cheryl Crow said it best, maybe a change will do you good. There are times, that, many times in my life, I need change to get me moving forward. The psalmist says we are to sing a new song. But the song we're, not, we're, we're supposed to sing is not just the words of the psalm itself. It calls us to sing a song with our whole lives, with everything about us. I think that's what Jesus is telling these disciples here. When we sing with our whole lives, we sing God's agenda of newness and change for us. And I have been made aware, really, 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 
that God's agenda is not always the same agenda that I have for my life. I'd be happy just to keep things the way they are. Newness is exciting, but scary and terrifying. But if it's God's change, there are ways that there's a creation, a newness to it, a recreation, a renewing, and a cultivating of newness in your life that will continue to surprise you, especially when you least expect it. This higher love that Jesus talks about, that's revealed to us through the Spirit, through the Father. I think this is what Jesus is telling the disciples. When you chew on me, when you live my life, the world needs light, you will be the light. The world needs hope, you will be hope. The world needs selflessness. You will show the world how to be humble. The world needs equality. You will show that there's nobody better than others. That in God's eyes, we are all the same. The world needs us to show how Christ walked with those that were oppressed and unique. How Christ prayed for all people. And how Christ served humbly without recognition. When we shine with the light of Christ, it may make some people walk away. But it may also say to some people, where could we go? You're the best friend I got. You give me that higher love. Amen.